All right, let's get started. So hi, my name is James. I work and I live in this city just a few miles away. Welcome to Seattle. I offer you my protection. Let's get started. Cloud computing, I'm told that it's the future. Everyone talks about it. Few people know what it is. Sometimes it looks like a blue pipe of information. Sometimes it looks like the matrix. Hey, look at that. It's a graph about big data that has qualitative labels for the axes. That's pretty cool. What are we going to do with all this cloud data? I say let's take it and throw it on an ocean. We can't do that. There's healthcare records on that information. So what are we going to do about the cloud? Let's get serious, guys. Let's get serious. Here's what I want to do with the cloud. So first, I want to take some unmodified uh, POSIX applications and Win32 applications that are I.O. intensive. So I mean things like the Postgres database or an Exchange email server or compilation tools like uh, Eclipse or Visual Studio. Then I want to deploy those applications uh, in the cloud to the same machines that run big data applications like MapReduce. And once those POSIX and Win32 applications are running, I want them to receive cloud-scale I.O. performance. So I want them to access storage at raw throughputs of 1,000 megabytes per second or more. I want the remote storage for those applications uh, to scale out using commodity parts, uh, just like it does for the rest of the cloud. And I also want those applications to enjoy transparent recovery of failed machines, in the same way uh, that big data applications can also enjoy a transparent failure recovery. So why do I want to do those things? Because these things would be amazing, kind of like the 1980s uh, when this picture was taken. Now, if we could achieve the goals from the previous slide, then developers could write just one version of their POSIX and Win32 app, and that app would automatically receive fast I.O. if it were moved uh, to the cloud. Furthermore, those migrated applications would receive fast I.O. without cloud operators having to expose their sensitive or proprietary protocols that access raw cloud stores directly. Now, an additional benefit is that uh, since we're running the POSIX and Win32 apps on the same hardware that's running traditional big data stuff, uh, the administrative efforts or hardware improvements that help big data apps will also help those POSIX and Win32 apps. So here's a basic outline of the solution, which we call Blizzard. Uh, the basic idea is pretty simple. So Blizzard's going to expose a virtual drive that applications can read and write uh, just like a real drive. Now behind the scenes, Blizzard is going to stripe that virtual drive across multiple remote disks. Now, you're probably saying, James, get out of here with this trash. This sounds like a lot of stuff I've already heard before. This sounds like Ray. This sounds like network attached stores. This sounds like Amazon's Elastic Block Store. Well, guess right. You're correct that there's a problem, and that problem is you. Don't be so negative, okay? This is why you don't get invited to parties. You got a bad attitude. So if you'll just listen for a minute, I'll describe to you why the naive approach for implementing virtual disks does not maximize the spindle parallelism for POSIX and Win32 applications particularly for applications which frequently issue F-Sync operations to maintain consistency. Now what I'll do is I'll describe three technical challenges and three solutions because of course the triangle is nature's strongest shape. So first, I'll describe a phenomenon called IOP convoy dilation. This dilation is going to cause non-optimal seek behavior on remote disks and it's going to limit the throughput for sequential read and write workloads. I'll then describe how a data placement strategy called nested striping can avoid this problem. Next, I'll describe how traditional data center networks uh, with oversubscribed network links uh, actually constrain the disk parallelism that's available to POSIX and Win32 applications. And I'll explain how uh, Blizzard can use locality oblivious storage, first proposed by FDS, to solve this problem. And then finally, uh, I'll describe how F-Sync operations act as write barriers, constraining how many parallel IOs uh, these applications can issue. And I'll describe how we can remove those write barriers by decoupling the notions of ordering and durability. This is going to allow Blizzard to immediately acknowledge write requests while still maintaining consistency. And then, of course, I will use scientific experiments and great personal charisma to convince you that I didn't lie about all those things I just told you about. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. We're going to begin with a straw man implementation for a virtual disk, and then we'll iteratively refine that straw man until we end up with the suave and deadly implementation that Blizzard actually uses. So the virtual disk uh, represents a linear range of bytes. So we're going to take that range, we're going to divide it into blocks, and we're going to stripe those blocks across the remote drives. So let's focus on the last two blocks in that range, which we're going to call X and Y. Now, if we look inside the remote disk, we'll see that X and Y are stored in adjacent locations within the same track. So what happens if the client performs a sequential scan of that virtual disk range? Well, here's what's going to happen over time. So first, an application uh, like SQL is going to issue two IOs, one for X and one for Y. Then the client OS is going to issue some network sends for those operations. Then the network is going to deliver those operations to the operating system on the, rem on the uh, remote server. And then finally, the remote server is going to issue those operations to the local disk. 
Now, the thing to notice is that due to the vagaries of the universe, the temporal gap between those two IOs will often spread over time. So, for example, even though SQL may perceive that it issued those writes immediately back to back, those writes may not hit the network card on the client side at the same time due to scheduling jitter on the client. And as the operations travel across the network, there may also be spread out due to buffering and things like this. Also, that remote server is handling requests from multiple clients, so they're scheduling jitter on the remote client side as well. So what does this all mean? Well, the disk has an I.O. queue. Now, in the ideal world, uh, the two I.O.s would arrive at that queue at the same time. And so what that would allow is a single head sweep to handle both writes. However, if the two operations are spread out in time, then the disk head will start moving and handle the operation to X, but by the time that Y arrives, the disk head will be out of position. Right? And so this means that we'll have to pay additional seat costs to move the disk arm back to Y. We call this effect IOP convoy dilation. Now, there's actually a pretty simple way that we can address this problem. So we take the simple linear mapping that I showed you before, and we change it to look like this, such that adjacent blocks are uh, actually mapped to different backing remote disks. Now, in this example, we say that we have a segment size of four. So what that means is that up to four sequential IOs will be handled by four different disks. So what's nice about this scheme is that now random and sequential IOs are now going to hit multiple spindles. And this is going to help to mitigate the impact of IOP uh, convoy dilation. Because even if those sequential requests get spread out as they leave the client, those requests will still hit multiple drives in parallel and have some hope of being handled simultaneously. So that's how we handle the IOP dilation problem. So you might be thinking, Victor, we're done. You've got 10 minutes left. Just get up there and tell some jokes. Now, unfortunately, uh, we still have some technical problems uh, to solve. So the next one we're going to solve is this thing called rack locality. Now, in some data center architectures, it's much faster uh, for a machine to talk to a peer that's inside of its own rack than to talk to a peer that's outside of its own rack. And this is because those cross-rack links are often oversubscribed. So uh, in this example, any two machines that are in the same rack can communicate at full 10 gigabit speeds. However, there's only 20 gigabits of uh, bandwidth between those two racks. Right? So if all four machines on the left try to talk to all four machines on the right, we're going to get an old-fashioned traffic jam. So returning to our Blizzard example, we basically have uh, a client that talks to four disks. Now, let's suppose that the client and the left two disks uh, are in the same rack, and that uh, the two disks in that Australia-shaped landmass on the right are in a different rack. Now, we went to all this trouble to spread I.O. requests across multiple disks, but now some of those parallel accesses will be slow. And in related news, ain't nobody got time for that. Okay, I went to all this trouble to make stuff fast, but now rack locality is trying to ruin my life. So how are we going to make all accesses to all remote disks fast? Well, the answer is that we're going to use uh, FDS, or flat data center storage. So FDS uses a network with full bisection bandwidth, meaning that there's no oversubscription in the core. FDS also allocates each physical disk with enough network bandwidth for remote clients to uh, access that disk at full sequential speeds. So for example, if you have a single physical disk, uh, it has roughly 128 megabytes per second of, of uh, throughput, or roughly one gigabit per second. So if a storage server has 10 disks, uh, then FDS is going to allocate that server uh, at least a 10 gig NIC. Uh, so the result of this architecture is a locality oblivious storage substrate. So clients can access any disk, regardless of its location, as fast as if it were a local disk. And furthermore, since all disks are cheap to access, FDS is going to enable aggressive striping schemes for virtual disks. So in terms of implementation, we built Blizzard as an FDS client. So there's a kernel mode SATA driver that receives IOs from the applications. That SATA driver uses a shared memory to deliver those requests uh, to a user mode FDS program. Now what the Blizzard client is going to handle is the nested striping, uh, which I just mentioned, and the delayed durability semantics, which I'll mention in a second. And what FDS is going to provide is that locality oblivious storage hardware and mechanisms to recover from failed server disks. FDS is also going to define a request to send clear to send mechanism, uh, which avoids edge congestion. So note that FDS is a system for running big data computations. Think MapReduce style applications. So by running Blizzard as an FDS client, we get this nice property that now POSIX and Win32 applications uh, can run in the cloud on the same hardware that's used to run traditional big data applications. All of the hardware outlays and administrative effort that helps big data applications will also help these POSIX and Win32 applications, and vice versa. So the critics said that it couldn't be done, but the critics were wrong. Okay? Can you feel the love in the air? This is a very poignant moment in the talk, so don't be afraid to show emotion. It's natural. Uh, so now you're thinking, okay, great, James, are you done yet? I'm ready to get in the next talk. And the answer is almost. I still have a little bit more time. We still need to deal with this issue of F-Syncs. Now, the problem with F-Syncs is that F-Syncs are used by POSIX and Win32 applications to implement crash consistency. 
So when an application makes an fsync call, uh, that disk only returns from the fsync call when all prior writes have become durable on the disk. So a common example of how fsync is used is uh, by a journaling file system. So the file system will uh, write the data blocks, then issue an fsync, and the metadata is only written when that flush operation completes. So that all sounds reasonable, but unfortunately, write barriers ruin birthdays. And the reason for this is because they constrain write parallelism and thus performance. So, for example, it's a lovely picture. I can send that to you on request. So, uh, suppose that we have the following write stream down there. Uh, now, what's going to end up happening is that the application will send writes to blocks A and B and do a flush, and then it will try to issue writes to additional blocks. Now, the problem is that uh, those latter operations cannot issue uh, until that flush operation completes. So that actually constrains uh, the parallelism there. So basically what Blizzard is going to do is going to use delayed durability semantics to remove those write barriers. The basic observation is that the traditional fsync operation actually combines both durability and ordering. However, to provide consistency, a flush merely needs to tag writes with their flush epic. Right? Later, the disk can asynchronously retire those writes in epic order. So let's look at an example. So here we see a client application, uh, a Blizzard virtual drive, and a remote disk that actually provides uh, the physical backing storage for that drive. So the application issues the first write to block Y, and Blizzard acknowledges that write to the application immediately, even though no write has been issued to the actual remote storage. The application issues a flush operation, and Blizzard acknowledges that flush immediately as well, incrementing the flush epic by one. The application issues a write to block X. Once again, that's acknowledged immediately. Now at this point, Blizzard decides to issue that first write to Y to the backing remote storage. Meanwhile, the client decides to issue yet another write to Y. At this point, a Blizzard learns that the first write to Y has become durable. So remember that Blizzard retires these writes in epic order. Right? So at this point, all the writes in epic 0 have completed. So now, Blizzard is free to issue all of the writes from epic 1. And that's exactly what Blizzard does. Blizzard receives another flush request, which is acknowledged immediately and causes the flush epic to be incremented once again. Another write comes in. Blizzard says, so on and so forth. We all are very familiar with lines and arrows. So, Let's suppose that Blizzard crashes at this point. Now, note that all of the writes have been acknowledged to the client, but that only the first and second writes to Y are actually durable. Now, this is actually OK because Blizzard has provided something known as prefix consistency. So if we look at which writes have become durable, we see that all writes up to some epic n minus 1 have become durable. Some, all, or no writes in epic n are durable. And then no writes from subsequent epics are durable. Essentially, Blizzard has lengthened the window of potential data loss in exchange for much better performance. And in practice, we find that many applications are happy with this consistency model. Now, you might be thinking, but isn't Blizzard buffering a lot of data, right? So for, for example, Blizzard has to retire writes in epic order. So in this example here, while Blizzard is waiting for epic zero to become durable, epics uh, one, two, and three can't issue. And they have to be buffered in memory. If Blizzard were to crash at this point, it will still provide a prefix consistency uh, but the buffered writes will be lost. So how can we reduce that amount of buffering? Well, let's see. We all know that all the major systems techniques were invented in the 1960s. So which one are we going to reuse today? Caching? I don't think so. Speculative execution? Doesn't feel right. Log-based writes? Yeah, I think that's going to be the winner here. So what we're basically going to do is we're going to treat uh, the backing storage as a distributed log. Now, as shown in this animation, whenever a write arrives, we're going to issue it immediately to the next position in the log. Blizzard is going to maintain a table that maps each virtual block to the appropriate portion in the log. And then periodically, Blizzard is going to checkpoint uh, the position in the log for which all prior writes are previously consistent. Blizzard is also going to checkpoint uh, the block map that belongs to that log position. So what's going to happen is that if the client crashes, uh, then it recovers by rolling forward in the log, as shown by the animation. Uh, please ignore the floating uh, Microsoft bar of excitement at the bottom there. Uh, and so basically what's going to happen is that if a log entry contains a valid write from a monotonically increasing epic, uh, then Blizzard's going to update the block map to refer to that block. And then Blizzard's going to examine the next log entry. Now, if the current log block uh, has a torn write or a write from an old epic uh, that is not referenced by any virtual block, uh, then Blizzard will terminate the roll forward. Now, I'll defer a longer discussion of the scheme to the paper, but suffice it to say that this scheme actually eliminates the need for a lot of that buffering while you wait for old epics to commit. So in summary, what have I showed you? I've showed you three aspects of Blizzard's design. Uh, to solve the IOP dilation problem, Blizzard employs nested striping, which uses write-through IOs through the remote disks. 
To prevent rack locality from constraining I.O. parallelism, Blizzard uses an FDS-style hardware architecture uh, that provides a locality-oblivious storage substrate. And finally, to eliminate the write barriers that are induced by F-Syncs, Blizzard is going to use delayed durability semantics to immediately acknowledge writes and flushes while still providing prefix consistency. So yeah, I get it. The queen is still not impressed. So now let me present you a few experimental results which prove to you that Blizzard is everything that I say that it is. So in this micro benchmark, we're going to look at uh, Blizzard's throughput for reads and writes of various sizes. In these experiments, the Blizzard drive was backed by 128 remote disks, and Blizzard used nested striping with none of the delayed durability tricks. So note that nested striping uses write-through operations on the remote disks, so the virtual drive did not receive acknowledgments for writes until they were actually persistent on some remote disk. So what that means is that these throughput numbers here represent Blizzard's maximum true throughput, regardless of any of the delayed durability tricks that we could have played. So we see that as block sizes get bigger and more data is returned per remote uh, disk seek, Blizzard's throughput can reach 1,000 megabytes per second or more, which is one of our key goals. Now note that sequential writes are sometimes slower than they should be due to a bug in the storage controller for our servers, but that's not a fundamental uh, problem with Blizzard's architecture. Now here we see a bunch of application level macro benchmarks for performance. Now here throughput is measured from the application's perspective. For example, how many megabytes per second a gzip process can scan. Now these results compare a Blizzard drive uh, and a single local physical disk. Now I'm not going to go into detail about these results, but suffice it to say that they show the expected outcome. Right? If you stripe application IOs across multiple disks instead of just one local disk, you'll see nice performance gains anywhere between 2x to 10x. Now here, uh, we show a cool property of delayed durability. The fact that it can hide the penalty of data replications, since a write that is replicated in ways can return immediately without waiting for that slowest replica to finish. So here, we compare the performance of the Exchange email server on a local disk and on several variants of Blizzard. So for example, here we see that when Blizzard operates in write-through nested striping mode with single replication, it's going to provide a 4x performance throughput over a local physical disk. Now we see that if Blizzard runs in single replication mode with fast acknowledgement, acknowledgement sorry, of flush operations, Blizzard is actually going to provide a nine-fold improvement compared to a local physical disk. Now compared to the single replication mode with fast acknowledgement, the log-based fast acknowledgement mode uh, is just as fast, even if Blizzard uses triple replication. So that's very nice. Now note that the log-based scheme is not actually faster than the vanilla fast acknowledgement scheme because it's still acknowledging writes immediately and flushes immediately. Right? So we've already gotten all the performance gains there. But what's nice about the log-based scheme, once again, is that if we were to crash, we would lose less data because we're issuing writes immediately. And I'll defer you to the paper for a detailed analysis of that. And also, very briefly, let me just note that we ran an unmodified SQL server on both Blizzard and uh, Amazon Elastic Block Store uh, using the same number of backing physical disks for each type of virtual drive. And we saw that Blizzard provides much higher IOP rates, both for reads and writes, for various number of SQL threads. But once again, for more details, I'll defer you to the paper. I've only been given 20 minutes to talk, so suffice it to say that due to time constraints, I will elide a discussion of the giants on whose shoulders I stand. But suffice it to say that according to my own self-evaluation, I give Blizzard an A+, because in the end, what really matters is whether you love yourself. So, <laughs> in conclusion, I've described how you can take unmodified POSIX and Win32 applications and run them in the cloud on the same hardware that runs traditional big data workloads, and you can provide those POSIX and Win32 applications with cloud-scale I.O. performance. I described three techniques that unlock this cloud-scale performance. Nested striping, an FDS-style uh, locality oblivious hardware store, and delayed durability semantics. Uh, working together, these techniques allow Blizzard Virtual Drive to provide over 1,000 megabytes per second of raw throughput to applications that have been unmodified. And compared to a local physical disk or an EBS drive, Blizzard provides a 2x to 10x performance improvement uh, with respect to what applications perceive. And with that, I thank you for your time, and I'd be glad to take any questions. Hi, I'm uh, Keith Smith from NetApp. Howdy. Um, so in the uh, IOP dilation, uh, problem you were dealing with, um, I was sort of following along and thinking of a different technique from the 60s, right? You've got these requests showing up that are separated in time, you'd really like to get, you don't want to blow a rev on the disk, and a lot of people would use prefetching of some sort to deal with that. Did you consider it, and did it work or not? Or? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so note that, you know, the app, the, the, the file system like NTFS or EXT, you know, X, uh, will often try to do some type of prefetching, right? So some of that will help us there. 
But one of our key uh, sort of design goals was not to modify the application at all. So we didn't want to sort of try to you know, do some type of machine learning thing where we look at disk patterns and try to sort of outthink the file system prefetcher. But we have been thinking about maybe there's something you can do to uh, do that for reads. Because a lot of our delayed durability techniques, they only make reads faster to the extent that now reads can issue sooner. Right, so, so is the implication that you found that the prefetching the file system and the disk buffer ca cache, the disk track buffer we're doing, weren't sufficient or weren't? That's exactly yeah. correct. Okay. That's exactly correct. You, 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 you go. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Nodir from University of British Columbia. Hi. Hi. Excellent talk, as usual. Thanks. Uh, I had a question about related work, like OptFS, yeah. uh, crash consistency. Uh, so they say uh, F-Sync is evil, so we can divide it to two. Like uh, they divide it to two and say this mm. is uh, D-Sync and O-Sync, right? Yeah. For durability and ordering. So how would you respond to that? Like if you design file system in uh, two different ways? It's a good question. Yeah, actually one of the people who worked on OptFS, VJ, he was actually my intern. Uh, so I actually have sort of first-hand knowledge of why F-Syncs are evil via him. Uh, so you're correct. Now note once again that one of our key uh, design goals is to not modify applications. Right? Now what ends up happening is that as a result, you know, if you run this unmodified application at top of Blizzard, then it doesn't actually know that we're sort of making this trade-off between performance and extended uh, sort of data loss in the case of a crash. Right? Mm -hmm. Now empirically speaking, a lot of people are actually fine with this trade-off. So for example, if you want to have a good laugh, go look at a database form that's run by administrators, the things that they do to get performance is just unholy. It's like something from a horror movie, right? They disable this, they disable you know, flush things, all this kind of stuff. So long story short, I think we can make a similar um, API change to the virtual disk to expose the, no to expose the notion of this is just an ordering F-Sync and this is a ordering plus durability thing. That would require applications to be rewritten, but it's easy to do. But what I will end with is that, note that OptFS put these notions of delayed durability in the file system, we put it at the lower layer inside of the disk, which means that we can actually use delayed dur durability semantics without changing the, up the, uh, the overlying file system at all. So it's actually a more general, a general approach. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Hi, Miguel Philippe from DynamoDB. Hi. Hi. Um, so um, on your delayed durability uh, thing, one thing that strikes me is what happens to read after write semantics and uh, latencies on, on the presence of faults because you're optimizing a whole lot and the data, the data won't be there. You yes. have to recover it. Yes, that's a good question. So suffice it to say that there's some detail in the paper that I elided in the talk about how you deal with reads to writes that are still buffered and not persistent on remote disk. So essentially what you have to do is that uh, you have to keep uh, a cache of those operations around such that, like let's say a write comes into block X and we acknowledge it immediately. And then it's not actually persistent on the remote disk. Now if a, a read comes in immediately for that block, then we can't actually satisfy that read from the remote disk. So to satisfy it for that cache. So yeah, we do take care of things like that. Okay. Hi, Ashwin Goel, University of Toronto. Hi. So um, for the prefix consistency and your delayed durability, um, you know, traditionally most applications, at least at the application level, when they call F-Sync, they do expect immediate durability. Um, and, and you know, you claim mostly that's not true. I'm just wondering whether, you know, other than that database example that you just yeah. gave, you know, is that really true? Like if I have a mail server without the replication, um, you know, if you're providing this delayed durability and there's a crash, um, you know, my mail suddenly either gets lost when I'm not expecting that, uh, or, you know, maybe it's in the wrong folder, et cetera. It just seems like um, building an entire system based on this delayed durability notion when the application expects something else seems like a really problematic well, I mean, I, I would say that empirically speaking, there are a lot of applications that are actually fine with that. I mean, some of this uh, survey work was done in the OptFS paper. Like I said, if you look at the forums or people who even run things like, you know, email servers or things like that, empirically speaking, many people think that crashes are sufficiently rare enough um, that they are willing to uh, sort of engage in that trade-off. But let me just note that if your application is not prepared to make that trade-off and it actually does not like that level of, a data, cra of, of data loss, it can actually use uh, the nested striping mode, which does write through IOs, right? So if you remember from that first uh, micro benchmark about throughputs, that write through mode actually still provides a lot of great performance because it does do very aggressive striping. And in that mode, we actually don't need to worry about flushes at all, right? So any individual IO does not act back to the client until it becomes persistent. Do you actually issue a flush to the disk when you do that? Yeah, all of the all for of each the, of those striped IOs. That would yes, be sir. really so expensive. Yes, sir. So all of those. Ah, but with the magic of parallelism, it actually isn't. 
right? You're correct that if you were just having one single disk, we were doing write through, write through, write through. That'd be horrendous, right? But if, if your application is issuing a ton of parallel IOs, it turns out not to be a problem. So if you have one of those applications that needs those uh, uh, sort of tighter loss bounds, then yeah, you just operate in write through mode.